Well, welcome back. Uh, welcome to Supervision. My name is Robert Farrell. I'm a licensed professional supervisor, sorry, licensed professional counselor supervisor here in the state of Texas. Um, there's times when I don't feel overly professional or overly supervisorial, but the purpose of this series is to help LPC associates uh, that are under me here in the state of Texas uh, grow and develop and uh, eventually drop their associate status to a full licensure. Uh, of course, this series is uh, non-monetized. I am not getting anything for it. I'm putting it out there for my people. Now, if you are not one of my uh, supervisees, one of my LPC associates, you can get stuff out of this as well. This is meant for anyone who is a LPC or works in the mental health industry. Uh, as you can tell, today's topic is self-disclosure, and that's what we're going to be talking about briefly. This is actually my second attempt at doing this uh, episode on this topic. Uh, my first one, for some reason, the technology didn't want to work with me, and I had uh, a really good presentation put together. And for some reason, my computer and memory systems uh, got corrupted. I don't know how. Very strange. It was uh, just one of my hard drives got messed up, and so I had to replace it. So, in any case, here we are today um, looking at self-disclosure, and we're going to be going into some details about that. Uh, I did this based upon a couple of research articles that I found, and I'll reference them at the end of today. So, in any case, uh, again, welcome to Supervision, and let's get started. So, what exactly is self-disclosure? Put simply, self-disclosure is when you disclose information about yourself to your client, uh, and it can have a multitude of reasons, a multitude of uh, problems that go with that, and ways that it can help or hinder the therapeutic development of your client. We're going to be talking about those specifically, uh, but self-disclosure is simply placed as you're saying something about yourself to your client for whatever reason, okay? And so we're going to be looking at four different types of self-disclosure uh, initially. So uh, those fall under fourth uh, areas that would be accidental, uh, unavoidable, uh, client-initiated, and finally, uh, the one you want to aim for will be the deliberate, the intentional. So let's look at these a little bit more uh, closely and unpack them. So the unavoidable self-disclosures are uh, oftentimes when we reveal things about ourselves, uh, about our personal life, through obvious things. Things that uh, we don't really intend on talking about, they just come out. Uh, for example, uh, if you are married and have a wedding band, people see that. They notice it's there. Uh, they can tell that you are married, or at least that you have a band on. Uh, and so they're going to make certain assumptions. Other things that are unavoidably obvious, uh, skin color, racial, gender, clothing, uh, of course, jewelry. Uh, if you are open about your faith and you're going to wear a religious pendant or something on your clothing that shows any spirituality, uh, earrings, or other kind of jewelry item, uh, then that would also be obvious. They would see it. Um, so this aspect of the unavoidable self-disclosure happens on a daily basis. Uh, a lot can be deducted from that. Okay, In your assessments with clients, you're going to be seeing them and picking up on the obvious, unavoidable, unintentional level of self-disclosure about them when they come into your office or when you first meet them. So this one here is one that some of it we can change, some of it we can't. Your clothing, for example. Uh, I chose today to wear a black shirt and I'm wearing khaki pants. Uh, I like the color combination and so it works for me. Some people may interpret that uh, to be one thing or another. I don't know. But we, they all make assumptions. Everybody makes those judgments when we see other people. So the accidental. Uh, this is a self-disclosure where we have it unplanned. 
It is not rehearsed. It is accidental, as stated. Uh, oftentimes, these can be verbal or nonverbal reactions in sessions uh, where we reveal something about ourselves that we don't always plan on. Okay? Uh, this can be very damaging, uh, depending on what's the motivation behind it. Uh, and, and that's why I like that image there of uh, the, the cat, the individual spilling something, and then kind of like, oh, that, I, that wasn't me, I didn't say that. Uh, it's possible and easy to do. I think everybody can do this accidentally. We can overextend ourselves, over self-disclose, overshare something, and then go, oh, I wish I hadn't done that. Uh, but accidental self-disclosures do take place, and you want to be cautious of that. Be aware of that one. Okay, client initiated. This one's a little bit different. This one here is outside of your control as, your, as a counselor. This one is occurring when the client looks you up online. They Trust me, they will do this. They will look you up on Facebook. They will look you up on Twitter. They will look you up on Instagram, on TikTok. They will do a Google search of your name. They will get information about you that you don't realize is out there which is why it's very important for you to be cognizant of what is out there. Do a search on yourself. Find out what is there. Because trust me, your clients are already doing that. Okay, uh, another aspect of this one here is caution, even though you can't prevent what they're doing outside of your office in that regard. Uh, this is really easy for boundaries to get blurred. So there is a, a note of caution here. Uh, that's why you want to go and check for yourself what is out there in the uh, web, what's on you. Um, also, be aware of what you're putting out there on Facebook and that kind of thing. They'll find it. Trust me, a lot of these folks are very tech savvy, even if you are not. Okay. Uh, now, the deliberate self-disclosure, this is the one you're actually using intentionally. Uh, this self-disclosure is of personal information that you are purposefully giving to your client in a session as a tool. Okay, This is a therapeutic intervention. This is a mechanism through which you are deliberately and intentionally planning an outcome. Okay, and that's what makes it different. You're, you have an intended benefit. Okay, so it's planned, it's intentional, uh, it is a choice as opposed to the accidental uh, or the unavoidable format of self disclosure. Okay, so what are some of the benefits of self disclosure? Well, here is some interesting aspects. There really are benefits to this. We're also going to be looking in a moment at the detriments, the problems. Uh, but some of those benefits would include rapport development, rapport building. You are uh, developing a relationship with your client, uh, and it's essential that you develop a good rapport with them. Your therapeutic alliance is such that as you are growing and helping them and getting that relationship where they begin to have trust in you, they're listening to what you're teaching them, uh, they're able to open up about their self-disclosures, and they begin to really open and work. Well, in order for your alliance to develop, you have to have that before. There has to be something there that you can connect with them on. Uh, and here's where the deliberate level of self-disclosure comes in beneficial, recognizing what after you've done your assessment with them, you know the areas that they're going to be working on. If there's something there that you can relate to them with, and you can share a little bit about yourself intentionally to open up that connection, that's a good tool to use, a good therapeutic alliance development aspect. Okay, uh, another aspect is often referred to as a quid pro quo, uh, kind of you rub my back, I'll rub yours, we'll work together. Also known as a give and take relationship. 
Uh, a lot of times clients feel very uncomfortable dealing, uh, dealing with a, a counselor in the beginning because they don't know you. And they may not feel comfortable sharing information. Uh, trust has to be established. And I like to point out to a lot of my clients that in order to establish trust, they have to do something very uncomfortable, which is to take a chance. They have to, they have to risk sharing information. Well, you can do that deliberately sharing just enough information about yourself that they feel a little more open with you. Uh, we can role model that quality of developing trust and how to share a little bit in order to get the ball rolling. Um, this also helps reduce that uneasy feeling that they might have in the beginning, uh, in the first couple sessions. Now here's another interesting aspect. If you are working in a psychiatric facility, hospital, uh, and the like, you may only have one or two chances at an intervention with your client. Your initial assessment, and you may have a couple session or a family session uh, or a discharge planning session, uh, but you're only going get, to get a couple chances. The likelihood of developing a lot of rapport with them and then getting into that give and take is greatly reduced. Now, on the flip side, in a uh, IOP, PHP, where they're in for more time, or in a private practice setting where you're going to work with them for a lot longer period of time, this is where this one really comes into play. That give and take relationship really begins to develop the therapeutic alliance, at least in the beginning. All right, so another aspect of benefit of uh, self-disclosure is showing empathy, letting them know that you can connect to what they're feeling, what they're experiencing in their life, very important. What are their struggles? Are you able to relate to them? Very beneficial, okay? Now you yourself do not have to have a history of whatever problem it is they're dealing with. Uh, for example, in session, uh, in, in group session the other night, we talked about for supervision topic, the topic of self-disclosure and I commented you do not have to be in recovery from a substance or an addiction in order to help them, okay? Allow them to teach you about their self, their problem, their situation, their struggles, and then let them see that you can connect and relate. Self-disclosure, if you can find that connection, it can be very powerful at that moment in time. Uh, Often clients do need to understand that you understand them, and this is how we would do it. Very Rogerian in approach, uh, but having that accurate empathy is a key component to self-disclosure, letting them know that you, you get them, you understand them. Okay, also it is real important for them to realize that Counseling is not one-sided. Uh, if you're going to approach it to where they have to tell you everything, all the problems are theirs, you can't relate to it, you're just there to listen and then to analyze them and tell them how messed up they are, uh, they probably are not going to stay with you very long. Uh, so by self-disclosing what you're doing is you're letting them realize it's not all about you or all about them. It is a team effort approach. And by using that of concept, what you're doing is you're equalizing the field, letting them realize that it is not one-sided. It is not just, as the image shows, it's not you going, well, it's all you. You need to talk. It's a shared experience. That's the therapeutic alliance and therapeutic relationship development. All right, so another aspect of the benefits of self-disclosure is the humanizing quality of when people realize that we are like them. We're not standing in an ivory tower. We are humans able to relate, able to understand the plight, the struggles they're in. Then what we're doing is we're letting them relax into the idea that we are not the know-it-all professional 
who has got tons of stuff on the wall of credentials uh, that were actually on their side and want to do a work union uh, where we, it, it's working together. It's not an us-them relationship, it's an I-thou. We have joined with them. Uh, and as the image there of the chicken show, uh, we're in it together. Okay, so an important aspect. All right, so risks. Risks are a big problem, all right? So there are risks in our self-disclosing, and we're going to look at several of them here and in the next slide. Uh, the first risk uh, that I want to talk about is shifting goals of counseling. And you want to be real careful in doing this. Inadvertently, we can shift a focus and the goal gets moved at that moment in time. Uh, you have to ask yourself, if you're going to self-disclose at that moment, what's the reason for it? Is it your own discomfort and you're helping to shift away from a topic that they're on? Or are you doing the accidental uh, self-disclosure? If that's the case, then shifting the goals is a major risk that you're going to run into. Uh, the sharing of too much information by you as the counselor to your client uh, of your personal struggles can really impair them. It can shift their attention away from themselves and they can interestingly enough, absorb some of what you're talking about and it gets things very confusing at that point. So another one is shifting the self-focus away from the client onto you, the counselor. Uh, excessive personal sharing, uh, not just in one session, but in multiple sessions, can be really damaging. Okay, Because what that tells the client is they're not the important one. The counselor is. Because if you're talking about yourself throughout a good bit of one session or a little bit in every session, then it conveys to them you're not as interested in them, you're not into their problems, their concerns, that yours is more important. So taking on a self-focus in your self-disclosure is a risk that can be perceived by the client. Now another one uh, is a violation of values and goals. This one's kind of unique. Depending on what you're sharing and what you're talking about, you can inadvertently, accidentally share about yourself that would be offensive to a client. Uh, depending on your word usage, your language, uh, if you share personal experiences that they believe to be unhealthy, inappropriate, okay? Uh, it, uh, an example that comes to mind would be on an abortion issue. Uh, let's say uh, your client has had an abortion and you haven't, and you say that, well, I've never had that. I don't believe in that. All of a sudden, you have just really hurt your client, and you have jeopardized the therapeutic alliance that you've been working on, and there's a problem. Now, let's flip it around. Maybe you have had an abortion and your client doesn't believe in them. All of a sudden, you have just violated one of their ethical or moral values, and in turn, you have possibly damaged that relationship and rapport building you've spent so long working on. Sharing personal experiences or views uh, that violates a client's value system really threatens the trust that they have developed. So you don't want to be careful of that one. Now, uh, a boundary violation, guys, this one here is a big one, okay? This one starts to move into our next layer of some ethical considerations. But boundary violations, if you share too much, uh, then it blurs that boundary of your role and the therapeutic alliance that you have, okay? You can inadvertently go from being the counselor, the therapist, the one there to help, to being a friend, being 
something other than the counselor. Uh, and you want to be very cautious of that. That level of self-disclosure can create a lot of problems, not only for the client and with regards to their goals, their values, their therapeutic direction that they're heading in, but it can also get you pulled in front of the board for an ethics violation where you have to explain what happened and why. And so uh, that is not something you want to get involved in. All right. So. All right. So now we're looking at some ethical considerations. Um, these are the things that we left off with at the end of the previous slide. And we're going to go in a little more detail here because ethically, this is the area where you will get in trouble in self-disclosure. All right, so you have to consider the benefits, asking yourself way in advance. In using self-disclosure, just how are you going to disclose? Will it help the client? Now, unless there's a clear benefit, um, don't do it. You have to be able to identify and be able to write it out. If I had developed this and I say this about myself, what is it going to do with a client? Okay, now I do self-disclose uh, as needed. I've had a little more experience at this. And so I have areas that I am comfortable in relating to people with. The benefit is the humanization, the development of the rapport. Um, I know certain areas that I feel very confident in being able to identify the benefits when I self-disclose. So you want to do that in advance. Consider your benefits. Another one is considering those risks. Think about how that self-disclosure might rebound on your client. Uh, what's the purpose and the use of that self-disclosure? And taking a moment to consider the potential uh, pitfalls and risks that go with it. Um, what, what are the benefits? Very important. Uh, also, Ethically, in your self-disclosure, be brief. Be very, very short on how much you share, not only in time, but in the uh, amount of information that comes out. Uh, say what you got to say and then stop. Okay? Be very concise, limiting details. Um, the, the, this is a less is more situation, so those details can really create problems. Uh, sometimes all you got to say is, I had a similar event happen in my life. And that's it. Okay, so being brief, very powerful uh, technique. More ethical stuff. Guess what? Now we're looking at a few more specific aspects of the ethical components. Using I statements, talking about yourself, you want to role model that I statement approach. I have had similar experiences. I remember when that happened to me. By doing that, what you're really doing is showing them the human quality and your life experience. Um, and, and that at the same time, you're not speaking as a professional at that moment. You're talking about your life, okay? It's really easy for a boundary to get blurred where they assume you're talking professionally and you're normalizing an issue when all you're really doing is self-disclosing from your own personal life. So use those I statements effectively in this case. Okay. Again, uh, considering your client's ethical and moral values. Uh, in as much as making disclosures, uh, you're not aligning your client's values with yours, you want to be careful of that. Uh, refrain from using self-disclosure until you've had time to acquire an accurate sense of what your client's value system is. Okay, so as a part of your assessment, one of the things I do is I'll ask, what was their childhood spirituality and faith like? What did they believe in as children? What was their family like? What is it now? Has it changed? Okay. Getting to know their values is very important. Now, another aspect um, 
evaluate. After you have self-disclosed, you want to kind of watch your client. How do they respond? How do they take that statement? What does it look like they've done with it? Did they relax? Did they open up more? Are they conveying more information about themselves? Uh, did you help them bring down a rigid perspective of the relationship? Are you now forming more rapport to where it's an us and problem perspective? That I thou relationship is the empathy accurate? All of those things that we've looked at really need to be evaluated. Yeah, you can even go so far as to ask them, how does you know how, how do you feel knowing about I have had similar experiences? Asking them things like that, they'll they'll tell you, and thereby you're doing an evaluation. So it's an important component. Okay, we are almost done. Here are the two references I used in the construction of this video. Uh, Zur on self-disclosure, uh, really, really good textbook. Uh, the Cyclopedia of Psychology, uh, really good. So all I can say is, guys, if you're going to buy some books out there, that's a good one to have. It has lots of uh, reference material in it, great areas to contemplate and think about in your practice. The other one is an article, uh, Audit C and Everall RD, Counselor Self-Disclosure, Client Informed Implications for Practice. Uh, and that came out of the Counseling and Psychotherapy Research, uh, Volume 3, or Edition 3, depending on how you want to word it. Uh, and that was on pages 223 to 231. Uh, really important things to think about. Uh, and I, I, I want to point out, those are just two. There are tons of more references on this topic of self-disclosure, uh, the ethical impact, the uh, issues that are that go with it, things you really want to take into consideration. All right, we have now concluded the topic of self-disclosure for this episode of Welcome to Supervision. I do want to point out, guys, this is not a full discussion, okay? There is so much more to go into a discussion of self-disclosure. The purpose of this video is to get you thinking about some of the components, the risks, the benefits, the motivations for it. Why would you want to share? I want to end it by, by pointing out what you do share may be more valuable to your client's benefit or detriment than you have intended. So they really, the clients that is, will really grab a hold of those things, okay? The relationship is, uh, that you develop with your clients has such a powerful impact and the role that we play that self-disclosure is an extremely powerful therapeutic tool that you want to wield very carefully. Okay, so uh, in conclusion for today, uh, I want to wrap up uh, just saying again, welcome to the supervision. My name is Robert Farrell, a licensed professional counselor, supervisor here in the state of Texas. Uh, please feel free to leave a comment, and uh, if you are one of mine, I will see you in our group sessions, and I will also see you in individual session uh, as time goes by. Uh, stay ethical. Keep doing what you know is right, and uh, by all means, take care of yourself and be cautious with how much you share in session or out of session. Look into your uh, online profile, how much is out there about you. Very important. It's amazing what people will look up about their counselors. So, until we meet, you guys take care.